1970, the astrologers tell us, marked the beginning of the age of Aquarius, a 2,000-year period in the progression of time when peace would guide the planets and love would rule the stars. A period of calm and serenity, which meant, of course, that the world of sports in 1970, like everything else, would prove to be unusually quiet, calm, and serene. didn't turn out quiet at all, not by a long shot. Throughout the year, in fact, the serenity of Aquarius was continually shattered by a brand of sports excitement no cosmic chart could possibly have predicted. And it all began on New Year's Day, when the Fighting Irish of Notre Dame were hooked by the Longhorns of Texas in the Cotton Bowl at Dallas. Fourth down and two, and the crowd on its feet once again. Notre Dame digging in on defense. Street, a quarterback, calling the signals from the 10-yard line. He needs two yards or he'll lose the football. He r- runs back. He throws it into the end zone. It's caught at the two-yard line. A first down for Texas on a pass to Squire. The football is one foot away from the Notre Dame goal line. Texas is trailing 17-14. to 14. It's third and goal to go for the Longhorns. They huddle between the 5 and the 10. They break the huddle. Street comes out at quarterback with Worcester, Bertelson, and Dale in the backfield with him. Street gives to the second man for a touchdown for Texas. There's a flag down, touchdown. Offside against Notre Dame declined, and Texas has scored with 108 remaining. Was this any way to greet the age of Aquarius? Maybe not. But the eyes of Texas were upon that national championship. And there's nothing quiet about Texans when they want to be number one. Two weeks later, the Kansas City Chiefs took on the Minnesota Vikings in the fourth annual Super Bowl. For the second year in a row, the underdog AFL team upset the NFL favorites. It was hail to the Chiefs as Len Dawson and company laid those purple people eaters out in lavender. And the Chiefs now will go for a long-range field goal. Jan Stenerud comes in the ball game. Holding again will be quarterback Lenny Dawson. The ball is down. The kick's up. It's in over end. The boot is up and long. It's good. A 48-yard field goal is good by Jan Stenerud with 6.52 to play in the first quarter. Richardson wide left. Again, the Chiefs with two tight ends, and the running backs are split. Third down and five. Running play coming to Garrett on a trap. Touchdown. Garrett scores with the five. Dawson, quick count. Dawson, close sideline pattern. Taylor. Taylor Hoover. 20, 25. He cuts back. 20. He's going to go. Oh, oh this Taylor, great move. He was hit at the 35. Pull loose. Went down the sideline. Pulled a great move. Went in for the touchdown. And the Chiefs lead 22 to 7. 20 seconds. 19. 18. The game is going to be over. Mike Livingston doesn't want to play anymore. Neither do the Chiefs. They've had enough. They want the football. They're going to blow the clock out. That's it. Chiefs are the world champions. 
a professional football. This just has to be our greatest moment as a football team. You know, as, as I look back on the game today and, and think about this great Minnesota team and, and ask myself why we won it and how we won it, I immediately think about our defensive linemen, then our linebackers, and then, of course, our defensive backs. And then it doesn't stop there. It goes to our offensive linemen, our offensive backs, and then, of course, the great job that Lenny Dawson did at the quarterback position. Then you have to go to our specialty teams. And when everything's all said and done, what does it spell? It spells 40 people, 40 dedicated people who are willing to make every personal sacrifice necessary for us to achieve this pinnacle. In February, Kurt Flood shook up the baseball owners by filing suit in federal court against the reserve clause. I went to Marvin Miller myself in New York, and I told him what I planned to do, and he tried to, he tried to play the devil's advocate. And he said, listen, uh, this is what's going to happen if you... If you do this, uh, if, you, if you've ever got uh, any idea about being a, the first black manager, for instance, or, or a coach or in, in the front office, you can just forget it. And uh, it, it took me two weeks to convince Marvin Miller that uh, I was very sin sincere about doing this. So I haven't been set up. Don't, don't kid yourself. I'm doing this because I think it's right. If Flood's action kept the age of Aquarius a bit off balance, this announcement by the commissioner of baseball later in the month knocked it for a loop. McLean's association in 1967 with gamblers was contrary to his obligation as a professional baseball player to conform to high standards of personal conduct. And it is my judgment that this conduct was not in the best interest of baseball. It therefore must be made the subject of discipline. Denny McLean admitted to the charges and as usual had plenty to say to the press. I was on the uh... 20th floor in Coon's office and I was standing by the window <laughs> when he told me I was indefinitely suspended. Uh, that was probably the darkest moment of my life and uh, I would have jumped out that window if I'd have thought about it much longer and the only thing I think that really prevented me from jumping out that window is looking down 20 floors and possibly if I'd have jumped it would have probably been a Boy Scout troop going by and I'd have killed about eight of them embarrassment uh, that I've caused for anybody. I'm very sorry. I'm very sorry to the commissioner of baseball that had to put him in the position, which I did. And uh, I just want to say I'm sorry to the public. Later in the year, Commissioner Kuhn did reinstate McLean to baseball. And on the Tiger Stars' return to the mound, he was greeted like a prodigal son. Right now, the Tigers take the field here at Tiger Stadium. A capacity crowd of close to 54,000 on hand tonight. Now, Denny walked out to the mound. Well, you hear the cheers for Denny McLean. A couple of boos mixed in. You always hear the boos a little bit louder in a crowd. One boo can make up the ten cheers. But there are surprisingly few boos. You can barely hear them. I'm not emotional. I've never have been. And, uh... I, I'm serious when I say this. Uh, I really thought I was going to cry for a minute because I almost swallowed my tongue. And that's just not me. And uh, believe me, I, I know my wife had to feel great about it. And uh, I'm happy. That, I'm just happy the way things turned out. This has been a, a, a trying time the last four months. And uh, I think you just have to look around. I think uh, one big thing, I've, I've learned i got a family. For the last 90 days, uh, if there was anything good to come out of it, I found out I've got a family. I've got three, three good kids and uh, a good wife, and uh, I didn't know I had that before. I knew I had them there, but uh, I'm no longer the kid who bring home gifts. I'm the man they call daddy now, and uh, that means a big difference. Huh? By the end of February, the age of Aquarius was hanging on the ropes, helped along by the jarring left hooks of Joe Frazier in the heavyweight title fight with Jimmy Ellis. Frazier comes out, digging that left hand to the body. Now Ellis is tying him up. He's got the right glove tied up. Frazier gets it free. Digs the right hand of the body, a left hand of the head. Another left as Frazier winds up with it. Then Ellis comes back with a right on the jaw. Frazier, that left hook on the chin, a right hook to the pit of the stomach thrown by Frazier. 
Ellis just stands there. Ellis can only hope that Frazier gets arm weary. That can happen. Ellis takes a right, then a left hook on the jaw. Sticks out a jab on the chin. Frazier comes into him. Ellis can't get away. He misses, steps under a left fire to his head. Tries to tie up Frazier. Blocks the left at his body. Gets away from the left. Counters with a right to the jaw. Then a left hook to the jaw thrown by Jimmy Ellis, who certainly is as game a fighter as Frazier has ever fought. Maybe as anybody has ever fought. There's a right hand to the head thrown by Frazier. Ellis just won't go down, and he misses the right hand over the head. Takes a grazing left hook to the jaw thrown by Frazier. Ellis, that left hook on the mouth. Ellis. Took a hard left hook to the jaw, brings on a solid right to the side of the face of Joe Frazier. Frazier coming in on him. Ellis finds him with two jabs. Solid jabs, and Frazier just laughs and comes back. Runs into a jab, runs into a left hook. Ellis boxing beautifully at the moment. Frazier brings up that left hook on the mouth. There's no defense for that, apparently. He digs the left to the body, a left hook to the jaw. Hurts Ellis. There's another left to the head. Another left hand to the head thrown by Frazier, and Ellis shamely comes back, firing a right hand to the head. A little less than a minute to go in this round. Frazier cornered, has him on the ropes, puts the left hand to the head, a right to the jaw. Frazier misses the left hand, brings that right and the left to the jaw again. Ellis in his own corner Two. goes down Two. and flat on his face. Two. And they are counting over him. Four. I don't think he'll get up. Five. Six. Six. He's trying to get up. Seven. Seven. He's Eight. on one knee. Eight. Nine. Ellis gets up at the count of nine. And the gloves are wiped off. Here's Frazier coming after him. The round is almost over, by the way. The round is almost over. If Ellis can last a few more seconds, he takes two left hands to the head, fights back with a left hook on the jaw. Frazier pounds the right hand of the body. Ellis is game. But he goes down with another left hook on the jaw. Two, he is on his three, three, four, five, six, The bell is down. He's got to get up. Seven, eight, nine. He makes it and goes to his corner. The fight is over. The fight is over. Joe Frazier is the heavyweight champion of the world. Angelo Dundee, did you stop the fight, yes, Angelo? Sir. Yes, sir. Uh, Jimmy, I'm sorry you didn't do better. You were a game fighter. There's no question. The winner. And good luck. You'll be back. I know you will. I know you must be disappointed, Angelo. Well, this guy landed a tremendous left hook and it turned the tide of the battle. So Jimmy didn't have nothing to go with. I was going to let him go out. Of course not. Well, thanks. That's, that's a real manager who really takes care of his fighter. Okay. Now we're going to try to get Joe Frazier. Joe. Yeah, Don. Congratulations. Thank Boy, you. you are something. Well, I try to be the best fighter in the world. And I think maybe a year or two I'm going to turn him in and find something else to do. <laughs> and a year or two if you keep going, there won't be anybody to fight. Hey, how about that? One more question. Now, Ellis looked pretty good in the first round. Did it bother you? Well, it didn't bother me at all because I see I can hit him with jab. After I could hit him with jab, I know good and well that he couldn't stand up much longer. Now, you talked to him a couple of times. What did you say? I said, you can't hit sissy. I said, I'm going to take your best right hand. You ain't got nothing. In March of 1970, UCLA, this year without the tall talents of Lou Alcindor, still had enough to win its fourth straight NCAA basketball title. Now to Morgan again. Morgan with Valley State falls down and gets the ball over in the corner to McIntyre, who shoots, and it's no good. Rebound taken by Wicks. Between now, Rowe checked in front court to Bibby. He's in front court to Baddeley. Baseline underneath Bibby. Beautiful. Owens on top. First time with 120 to go in the half. 37 36. Bibby cutting from the right. All right. Bibby's first two points of the night. Okay. Now, 37 36 Bruins at the same time. 78 to 67. <laughs> Missed by Andy Hill, rebound taken by Jacksonville, by Greg Nelson, up court, Wedeking behind the back dribble bit, off to the left, long outside cast, and goes, and that's from McIntyre. McIntyre, 78-69, full court pressure, Schofield, and in for a driving layup, John Ecker. Ecker, 80-69, to 69, 7 seconds, 6 seconds, 5 seconds, there's a cast up there that does not go, through seconds, out it comes, another throw up. And it will not go. End of the ball game. UCLA has done it again. For John Wooden, his sixth NCAA championship for UCLA. Steve Patterson down there being hugged by the song girls. It's a great moment for them. And at the NCAA Outdoor Track Championship at Drake University, a flash by the name of LaCorey streaked to a 3.596 mile. Well, it's been a good season so far this year, and a win here would sure make the season a success. 
Uh, it'll be memorable to me. And now taking the lead, it's Hector Ortiz of Western Kentucky. His best time ever as they go into the gun lap was a 4 4 And now Hector Ortiz has moved out in front. And Marty LaQuarrie starting to move up after him. Dennis Savage hanging on in third place. It is LaQuarrie closing in on Hector Ortiz of Western Kentucky. And going down the back straight, here goes Marty LaQuarrie. LaQuarrie has the lead. The NCAA meet record is 3.57.7, set last year by Marty LaQuarrie in winning at Tennessee. And he's pulling it out now. Dave Waddle. Putting on a sprint. Hector Ortiz dropping back into third. It's Marty LaQuarrie. Has the mile run well in hand. It is Marty LaQuarrie. It is David Waddle. LaQuarrie wins it. Waddle is in second place. And Howell Michael of William and Mary takes third. And the unofficial time, 3.59.6. Marty LaQuarrie repeats as the mile champion. In the same meet, Ralph Mann of Brigham Young set a new world's record for the 440 hurdles. Well, settling in. We're just about ready. And it is a good start. The NCAA meet record, 49-6. Mann's best is 49-4. It is West Williams, San Diego State. Wayne Hartwick, Wayne Collette on the outside, running in lane eight, hard up against the stadium. One of the most difficult places to run. But Colette would appear to have the lead as they come through the turn. Actually, a little bit of a short. And it's Colette. It is Colette. Next to the wall. And Ralph Mann, BYU. And Ralph Mann has the lead. Colette in the sprint. It is Mann. It is Colette. It is Mann. Ralph Mann of Brigham Young University has just won the 440-yard hurdles, beating Wayne Colette in a sprint to the tape. And listen to the time. 48.8. It's official, a brand new world record in the 440-yard hurdles. Man of Brigham Young University, when he gets the news, breaks down and cries in his joy. A tremendous accomplishment. A tremendous accomplishment. He not only nipped the world record, he broke it by a full half second. A great thrill, it really is. Well, I never thought that fast, but boy, I'll sure take it. Greatest thrill of my whole life, really it is. Well, I know when you get the thrill of winning... It doesn't matter what sport it is. The, the winning's all the same. It's great. It's a great feeling. When spring came to Seattle, the pilots took off and flew to Milwaukee. And what a sad day that was. Hi, Zimmerman covers the Seattle pilots for the Seattle Times. I, I'd say my reaction right now is angered. Well, I don't think anyone knows where to start. We've been in limbo down there. It's the darnest spring I've spent. And you sit and think about it, and... Uh, the overt situation would point to the fact that the uh, Soriano brothers and Bill Daly, more the Soriano brothers, are in trouble. When you think about it, I think the American League is in trouble because I think the American League has been very culpable in this thing. If you hark back to the original uh, granting of the franchise, two individuals, I'm not talking about the award to the city, uh, they awarded a franchise which now appears to have been uh, flimsy right from the go, overextended. Uh, from the moment they began operations, uh, most of the money was in notes to banks, to uh, the concessionaires, and uh, it was just a matter of time before it caught up with them. I say the league approved the flimsy franchise, and I think what I am angriest about is that the American League is in a measure maligning our city and our people, and they do not deserve it. Springtime is Stanley Cup time. And Bobby Orr and the Big Bad Bruins were busting out all over. Brown loses to Hodge. Puck is loose. Hodge out front. Catherine goes! The Bruins take a one of the lead. Espo right out front. Espo goes! It's two to nothing. Esposito has scored his second goal of the night. Orr the rebound. Orr gets by Stewart. A great move. What a shift. Across to McKenzie. Back to Orr. Shot. Oh! A great shot by Orr that never left the ice and beat Jackham and threw a screen. It's 3-1 to one Boston. At center ice, it's Bobby Orr. Marcotte off for tripping. Orr going through a shot. Oh! And Bobby Orr has scored a short-handed goal for the Bruins. Park trying to keep it in the zone. Can't do it. Kicked ahead for Salveson. Sandy going in. Shot. Oh! 
Two shot handles go on one cut away. The loose puck out front. That's for Zeno Scott. It's six to one Boston. And for Espo, the hat trick. Centering pass. Shot. Oh. And McKenzie has tied it up. A blistering bullet that Sachuk still hasn't seen. McKenzie out to Stanfield. Busick on the left wing. Moving through. Shot. Go! Or checked by Kachuk. Gets away from Kachuk, and he's got the puck. Using Ballone as a screen into Westfall. Cutting through. Go! It's five to two. The Bruins have reached the Stanley Cup Finals by beating the Rangers four games to two in the playoffs and scalping the Blackhawks four games to zip. On the faceoff, Cashman digs it out. In tight. Shot foul! Wayne Cashman gets a big go-ahead goal for the Bruins. Bobby Orr legs it back up through center ice. Cuts deep. Goes behind the net. So Esposito. Shot down! Here comes Makita. Across to Magnuson. Shot. Great save by Jerry Cheevers, and he ties it up. How he got that glove on that shot, I'll never know. Still going to Bobby Howe. Back in front. Great stick save by Cheevers. Here's Keith Magnuson out of the Chicago zone. Feeds Bobby Hull through center ice. Hull tied up by Don Marcotte. Goes into the boards in the Boston corner. Centering pass across from Dennis Hull to Magnuson. He drives. Kicked out by Cheevers. Brian Campbell shoots. Scores. Two seconds showing on the clock. The Bruins lead it 5-4. to four. Face off. Backhander by Westfall. It's tied up at the buzzer. And the Bruins are East Division champions. The end came in typical Bruin fashion. In sudden death overtime on a goal by Bobby Orr. All set to go. Sudden death overtime. The Bruins and the Blues tied at 3-3. Three to three. Sanderson draws with Berenson. Puck skips inside the St. Louis line. Carlton goes for it with Ecclestone for che- back checking. Out front. Cleared by Talbot. But kept in. Larry's shot is blocked by Talbot. Sanderson's drive is wide. Ecclestone the rebound. But it's kept in by the Bruins. Ari to Westfall. Sanderson's drive again is wide. Kept in by Orr. Orr feeds Sanderson behind the net. Back to Orr. He scores! He scores! He scores! He scores! He scores! He scores! And Bobby Orr's been robbed by the entire Bruins teammates. The Bruins have won the Stanley Cup. Bobby and his dad, Doug. Thanks, Don. It's, uh, uh, it's so great. I don't, know, I don't want to say. This team, unbelievable. The guys that are hurt, they're out yelling for us between periods. They're in the stands. They're fighting for us. The guys that are playing goaltending, to, you know, to, yeah, we put everything together. Just a great bunch of guys. Great. This is the happiest day of my life. This is the happiest day of my life. I, I, I couldn't wish for anything else. The late Lou Jacobs called Dust Commander the best-looking colt he had ever seen. After the Kentucky Derby, we all knew why. They come for the finish. Dust Commander is on the rail. He has the lead. My dad, George, a late move. Final screen. Here on the outside is High Echelon. They're coming on to the way. And look at Dust Commander open up as he hits the finish. Dust Commander a big winner. Then my dad, George, second High Echelon. Third and Nasser is fourth. Final screen is fifth. And boy, what a big win that was. The same sort of win that you had in the Bluegrass State. Dust Commander was to fail on his bid for the second leg of the Triple Crown when the Preakness turned into a personality contest. In a race of a different color, Bobby Unser's brother, Al, won the Indianapolis 500. Al Unser in the Johnny Lightning Special, number two. He goes to turn number one. This completes the Unser Brothers Act for today. There goes Al Unser by us right now. Into the short shoot, getting a wave on from the fans. We pick him up as he comes right through here and uh, moving along very nicely. Right on through our turn, out of the outside wall and right up the back stretch, uh, just like he's been doing all day. And he's going by our vantage point right now, running very smoothly, stroking it here on the back stretch, half a lap away from victory and up to turn three. And here he is in that brilliant blue, yellow stripes. Johnny Lightning special. Alonzer goes by to turn number four. The handsome man from Albuquerque, the blue number two, and he got quite a hand up here. 
here. The crowd rose as one when he came by, and that's a great tribute to a great driver with a great car. Al Unser, the checkered flag, the winner of the 1970 Indianapolis 500-mile race. And his crew goes wild. And meanwhile, along the track, a Brit, his brother Bobby, who won here in 1968, is uh, coasting in as if to say, okay, kid, it's your turn to win this 500-mile race. It's all yours. And here in Victory Lane, the pipers are piping. We have safety patrolmen ringing this checkered carpet. And we now have the arrival of Al Unser in the Johnny Lightning number two. Al Unser and friends and family and now microphones. Al, could we maybe take a moment and start with the beginning of the day? We had that uh, terrible delay, the rain. What does that do to you? Well, it uh, really works on a guy's nerves quite badly. It, uh, it really makes you feel like it, uh, uh, nothing's going right, but uh, it turned around and everything worked out real good, so uh, we're happy. And Mom Unser here to give Big Naughty somebody like this to drive it around, huh? Yes, he's wonderful, and my son is too. I've seen you here twice in a couple of years. That must be grand. It really is. It's remarkable. You've heard the phrase, put it all together? Well, in 1970, that's exactly what the New York Knickerbockers finally did and walked off the court with the NBA crown. How long did it take them to put it all together? 24 years all together. We have 25 seconds to the championship. Outside Bradley looks at the clock. Center court, Frazier as the crowd on its feet roaring. Frazier, top of the key. Outside to Busher. In the corner, Frazier. He drives to Barnett for a jump. Yes! With 12 seconds remaining. 11397. Here come the Lakers out of the backcourt. The Nick benches up on its feet, jumping as West is fouled on the forecourt. Fred Holzman has to hold back some of his players. The Knicks are hugging each other on the bench. Confetti from the uh, mezzanine area here at Madison Square Garden as West gets set to take his foul shots. Eight seconds remaining in the ball game. It is Bedlam here at Madison Square Garden. The first by West is good. Here's the second. It is good. 113.99. The Knicks in by the bottom of the backcourt. Cross court to Busher. Five seconds. The Busher holds the ball. Three seconds. The Busher holds the ball. Two seconds. The Busher holds the ball. That is it. The New York Knickerbockers have won the 1969-70 World Championship of Basketball. They are being mobbed as they head to the dressing room. The New York Knicks are the world champions in a devastating run. This had to be one of your greatest games, isn't it? There's no tomorrow, so we had to give it our all from the beginning. I felt good. The shots were there, and I just took them. The crowd has psyched us up for the game. Willis, this has got to be a great moment. This is the greatest feeling of all. You know, you, you, you dream about being the world champs, but this is a great feeling. You know, it may not never happen again, but at least it happened once in my life. It's a long season, a lot of aches and pains, and a lot of guys pulling together, a lot of guys, you know, doing a lot of things together. And I think this is what made us a ball club all year long, that we were a bunch of guys playing together, no superstar, just a bunch of guys that wanted to win the ball game. At the 1970 U.S. Open Golf Tournament, a dapper Englishman named Tony Jacklin shot it out with the best golfers in the world and won. I do like playing in this type of weather. I was brought up playing in this type of weather. I do enjoy playing in the wind because I, I, like, I like making shots up, you know. I, I, I like sort of, I might hit any cl club from 160 yards, you know. I might hit a three iron down the grip and half swing and push shots in and, and I quite enjoy that type of golf. And uh, so it, uh, it was a bit worrying on the putting today though because one, one could get a gust of wind and blow you off balance. After his victory, he took off for home on a jet, while the rest of the pros took off on the course. I had to play this course every day for fun. I'd find another game. Just because uh, you cut some grass out there and you put some flags in the ground, uh, that don't mean you got a golf course. What it lacks out there is about uh, 80 acres of corn and a few cows. <laughs> Looked as if nobody was ever going to win baseball's all-star game as the best of both leagues battle into extra innings. Two out in the sixth inning. No score. Yastrzemski drills one into short center field. Around third base comes Fossey. The ball is picked up. They'll have to go to second. Yastrzemski fell down, and it's one to nothing, the American League. Very ready again, trying to come in with the pitch, but something that Fossey can't hit. Drills one to center field. Back goes Gaston. 
Looking up and backhands the ball. Robinson tags at third. Oliva goes on to third base, and it's two to nothing, the National League. Gibson throws hard this time. Robinson drives Gaston back. Gaston on his horse. It'll be over his head, bounding against the wall. Yastrzemski scores. Horton is on his way around third base. He'll score. On the way to third is Brooks Robinson, and he's in with a triple. Hunter throws. Ball is hit to center field. Back goes Amos Otis. Back looking up at the wall. And Dixie has a home run. Peterson back. Ground ball. Base hit. Pass Johnson. Helton comes on to score. It's four to three. And the tying run. Morgan at third base. And Clemente the batter. Stalemar is ready. A drive out of the center field. Over comes the center fielder. Otis makes a fine catch. But here comes Morgan. We've got a tie game. Then to score the winning run the hard way came hard-nosed Pete Rose. One and one to the waiting Jim Hickman. And right into the stretch. Looking back and throws up the middle. Rose is on his way around. Picked up by Otis. Rose is coming to the plate. Throws a throw. He's in. It's all over. The National League wins. Pete Rose barreled into Ray Fossey, who is slow in getting up. Trying to block the plate. The ball wasn't there yet, and Rose just rolled a shoulder into him. And Fossey is being led away. But the National League has now won its eighth in a row. The line drive single of the Chicago Cubs' Jim Hickman scores Cincinnati's Pete Rose. In the waters off Newport, Rhode Island, Intrepid sunk Gretel II to stave off a challenge for the America's Cup but not without losing a race. What will Boss Mossbacker think? While Gretel was taking in water, Cincinnati fans were taking all bets that their big red machine, after flattening the Pirates three straight, would roll over the Baltimore Orioles in the 1970 World Series. Nothing doing, as Bench, Perez, May, the big guns of the Cincinnati Reds, were silenced by superb Oriole pitching. There was only one machine the fans raved about, that incredible vacuum cleaner down at third base, Brooks Robinson. 3-1 pitch to bench. Drilled. A stamp by Robinson. A line shot that Brooks Robinson dived and grabbed in his glove for the third out to retire the side. What a play. Bench pulls it. It's a ground ball of third. Brooks Robinson. The 2-2 to May. Swing ground ball, third base side. Brooks Robinson's got it throwing from foul ground toward first base. It is in time. And the golden glove artistry of Brooks Robinson was never more apparent than on that last play. Brooks, a lot of people uh, have been comparing you with Pie Trainer. Now, that must give you quite a thrill. Well, it sure does. Uh, I know Pie Trainer very well. I've been to several banquets and had many uh, long chats with him, and he's a terrific fellow, and, uh, and I'm sure he was uh, the world's greatest third baseman. And just uh, to rank behind him, as you know, he was picked as the greatest uh, all-time third baseman, and to, to, to be compared with him in the same breath, I'm very happy about it. The World Series of Golf followed baseball's annual classic, and Jack Nicklaus, after a long, dry spell, finally struck pay dirt. In the fall, tragedy struck the world of sports. Two plane crashes took the lives of 54 college football players and six coaches. And Vince Lombardi, coach of the Green Bay Packers in the glory years, died of cancer. Not all his players agreed with him. Not all his players liked him. But they did to a man respect him. Here's one reason why. To the winner, there is 100% elation, 100% laughter, 100% fun. And to the loser, the only thing left for him is a 100% resolution, a 100% determination. And it's a game, I think, a great deal like life, and that it demands a man's personal commitment, be toward excellence, and be toward victory. Even though you know that ultimate victory can never be completely won, yet it must be pursued with all of one's might. And each week, there's a new encounter, each year, a new challenge. But all of the rings and all of the money and all of the color and all of the display, they linger only in the memory. But the spirit, the will to win, 
and the will to excel, these are the things that endure. And these are the qualities, of course, that are so much more important than any of the events that occasion it. And I'd like to say that the quality of any man's life has got to be a full measure of that man's personal commitment to excellence and to victory, regardless what field he may be in. In college football, Ohio State ran roughshod over its Big Ten neighbors. Texas ran the Southwest Range and both battled week in, week out for the number one spot on the rankings. But after all the bowls were empty on January 1st, number one belonged to the Cornhuskers from Nebraska. The 1970 Heisman Trophy winner was a Mexican-American who passed the Stanford Indians into the Rose Bowl. His name, Jim Plunkett. I'm very fortunate in that I was chosen by uh, all the voters who voted in the Heisman Trophy. And, uh, you know, I like to think that on certain days maybe I am, and on other days I don't feel that way at all. Past winners of the, uh, the Heisman Trophy haven't uh, had such an outstanding record in professional football. Have you, have you thought about this at all? Is this a jinx? For... I haven't thought about it at all. I don't, you know, I... We did, we did a few things this year that, like beating SC and going to the Rose Bowl, which we haven't done in a long time, and I'd like to feel that uh, I'll continue this trend and uh, not let the two uh, play any part in the, uh, or let, not let the Heisman Trophy play any part in me being a professional. I, I want to go to the Rose Bowl. I, I want to beat SC, and uh, and uh, I want to enjoy this time with my I, I probably would have never made the friends that I have and been, been so close to my teammates as I am now. And uh, I thought that I could help the Mexican American community in this way too by, you know, by staying in school, getting my education, maybe setting a little example for uh, some of the kids who don't think school is for them or that education is out of their reach because uh, because they are Mexican or, or something like that. The expanded professional football league with its playoff system produced a new breed of excitement in 1970. After the smoke had cleared, the Dallas Cowboys and Baltimore Colts stood on top of the heap looking toward the Super Bowl. The big story, perhaps, was the rise of the San Francisco 49ers. Backed by a strong defense, quarterback John Brody brought them to their first divisional title ever. The ball at the 26th of Oakland as it's placed down. Brody now sends Washington to the near side, Witcher to the far side. Second quarter, 49ers go from our left to our right. Willard and Tucker, fake to Willard. Back to pass goes Brody. Looks, throws. For Qualic, he's there. Touchdown, 49ers. Touchdown to Qualic. A 26-yard throw from Brody to Qualic. He made an excellent play to beat Grayson. Washington flanked out the near side. Witcher split left. Third and four for the 49ers. Brody back to pass. He has time. He looks. He throws for Washington. Washington is there. He's got it. Touchdown, 49ers. Oh, what a catch. Witcher flanked the far side. The end's in tight. Brody. Fakes to Willard. He's going to go. He throws to Tucker. Touchdown, 49ers. Brody fakes and then throw to Bill Tucker. Tucker was all by himself and goes in for the score. This is it. It's, the 49ers That's will right. not run another play. It's 7, 6, 5, 4, 3, 2, 1. They've got it. And look at it. The 49ers have done it. They have won, and it's a really a happy bunch of 49ers. The first time in 49er history that they won a championship. In December, the sports world got a big Christmas present. Muhammad Ali came back all the way. Untested in his October victory over Jerry Quarry, the greatest proved he's still the greatest by going 15 tough rounds with rough, tough Oscar Bonavina and having enough steam left to knock him out in the final round. came from nowhere. Ali came through with a left. The crowd screaming. The first knockdown of the fight. He took the mandatory eight. And now Ali is behaving like the old Ali. One more knockdown in this round. The fight is automatically over. Bonavina is running. If he goes down again, it's over. Ali is the knockout winner at two minutes and three seconds by my unofficial clock of the final round. It began with a left. I'm going up to ring center. All right, I'm here in the corner of the ring with Angelo Dundee, Drew Brown Bundini hugging Muhammad Ali, and a tired but victorious Ali. 
talking. Now, first, what, you found Bonavina much tougher than you expected, obviously, didn't yes, you? Uh, the layoff bothered me. I uh, showed up. I uh, missed a lot of punches. But I'm glad it went 15. The word was I didn't have no stamina. I think I showed more than he did. And Joe Frazier couldn't stop him. He was really out. And uh, now we have a chance to see who the real champion of the world is. So uh, I'm feeling good, and I'm glad that I had the work. And I'm glad to know that I have a punch, as I said, I don't have. And I think he's never going to stop, right? Yippee. Now, Andy, you didn't know what was wrong with Muhammad Midway. There was nothing wrong with him. He needed to work. That's why I said I hope we had a few more rounds with Quarry. So he got to work tonight, which is beautiful. So he got a little wet tonight, which is great. So I was very happy with everything. Carmen was off, but he's a hard man to hit. And how many bruises do I have? I think I have one, don't I? Do you see any bruises? No, no, no. no, bruises. <laughs> no bruises. On the right eye, right underneath. It's here, a little right something here, yeah. I call in close, a foul shot. It's but I like to say I think I look a lot different from Joe Frazier after he came out of the ring. <laughs> he was beat to a pulp. And I don't have nothing but a little bruise, which is natural, a little cut lip. The predictions were to only publicize the fight, make the people angry. He talks too much. He needs a good whooping. <laughs> he needs a good whooping. I can't stand him. And they would fill up all hundred dollar seats. And I'd go to the bank laughing. <laughs> the age of Aquarius was only a year old at the end of 1970, but it had already produced a host of outstanding heroes. Bobby Orr, the Bruin, hockey's highest scoring defense man. Johnny Bench, a baseball superstar at 22, and a court magician called Pistol Pete Maravich, who broke the all-time collegiate scoring record. Maravich. Trivet, Maravich, from 35 feet away, scores! He tied the record! He tied the record at 7.54 in the ball game. The runner, she will have the ball, and Maravich will put it in play at mid-court. Trivet. Ole Miss stays with their 2-3 zone. But they're overshifting the feet side. Here he is. From 25 feet away, in and out! 93-76. 446 left to go in the ball game. Pete, from 18 feet away, hits it! There it is! 41 points! 41 points! Right now, I'm a little short. Uh, breaking someone of uh, Oscar Robinson's stature. I think he's probably the greatest basketball player ever played. And uh, I think I'm very fortunate to uh, break his record because uh, I followed him ever since I was a young boy and uh, I always felt he was the greatest and I felt like if I could uh, just maybe uh, play a little bit as good as he could or anything else that I could uh, do all right. I don't really think, uh, I really thought about the importance of it until you guys came running out on the court. And then I, I think I knew after that. Both Henry Aaron and Willie Mays got their 3,000th base hit in 1970. Hank Aaron at the plate with Felix Mian on second base, one down. First inning, game number two, today's twin bill. Beautiful day for baseball. And a swing and a high bouncer over the mound, charging over Woodward in front of the bag, up with it. Here's his throw to first, not in time. Mian is coming around third, he's headed home. Here's the throw from May to the plate, not in time there. He slides in safe, and Aaron is safe at first. And there's that 3,000th hit. Time is called. They're holding up the game, and here's Hank Aaron at first base, and the crowd is standing to applaud as Aaron doffs his cap Time called. He walks over, and here's Stan Musial coming out, Joe, to congratulate him and hand him that ball that he just uh, got his 3,000th hit with. Here's Willie. Wagoner delivers. Mays hits it in the left field. And goes number 3,000. Willie Mays gets the 3,000th base Dan Musial, Monty Irvin, Carl Hubble, 
Gaylord Perry, the entire ball club, congratulating Willie Mays on a single to the left, the 3,000th hit of his big league career. How you feeling, Will? I don't know. There's so much excitement going on now. I hope I can just feel good for the game. Mm -hmm. How does it compare to the 600th home run, Willie? Well, I don't think it can be in a comparison, but uh, the people seem to think so, so I'll have to go along with it. Are you glad it's over with? I am. I don't know about anybody else. Remember George Blanda? George Blanda. Wasn't he a blocking back for Jim Thorpe? Well, last year, the old man of the Oakland Raiders starred in a late, late show nobody will ever forget. A 47-yard field goal attempt by George Blanda. The angle is to the right. The ball is snapped. The kick is up. It is long. It is good. George Blanda. Blanda fakes the handoff. Back to throw, and he is hit just as he unloads. It is far downfield, and it is complete for the touchdown to Boletnikoff as Charlie Stooks fell down. As a pro football player, any time you step on the field, you're going to do your best to win and we have a lot of pride in our organization and our team that uh, we definitely are going to go out and try to win every football game we uh, we uh, we play. And uh, uh, that's the way I feel, and I know the rest of the players feel that way. Uh, uh, we are going to give it everything we've got. Quarterbacks get better with age. I think that you, you never learn everything that you have to know to pull out uh, uh, particular games and particular situations that arise uh, if you have coped with them in the past uh, you can cope with them a lot easier and I think that only comes with experience finally Tom Dempsey of the New Orleans Saints twisted the tail of the Detroit Lions in the closing seconds with a record-breaking 63 yard field goal not only will uh, Tom Dempsey hits this one he's got a very slight win at his back he'll set a National Football League record in addition to winning the game I don't believe this. It's good. I don't believe it. The field goal attempt was good from 63 yards away. It's incredible. Tulane Stadium has gone wild. A 63-yard field goal. <laughs> Nineteen seventy was a strange year, and a new sound of sport was heard in the land. Not calm, not quiet, as Aquarius would have wanted it, but strident, harsh, and loud, with threats of strike and cries of protest and the pounding of legal gavels. But it was also a very good year. Allie came back to boxing, Denny McLean to baseball, and the pro football players to the training camp. They came back because in the final analysis, it's the sport that counts. And the only sound that's important in sports is the roar of the crowd. Did the millions of spectators who came to a game in 1970 like what they saw and heard? We've got a feeling they did. How about you, Aquarius?